I mean, should we be trying to make London more environmentally friendly? And someone who thinks we should is the director of the Environmental Transport Association, Andrew Davis. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, Ken. So what is your association proposing? Well, our organisation um, is based on the idea that we need to travel, but we must travel as lightly on the earth as possible. And in terms of London, that means making sure that we can use the most appropriate mode um, in terms of walking, cycling, then bus, then tube. We've got tram now in, in the south, of course, and cars last. Um, and there are lots of things that can be done. You have made courageous in the past, courageous decisions, um, being in a congestion charge, although that was to do with congestion. That had an impact on the, the quality of life of people in the very centre of London. Um, we feel that there's so much more that could be done in London to make it a, a greener environment in terms of transport. And encouraging cycling and electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles would be a great start. We have the downside to what we're doing at the moment is that um, we're finding that the European Union is going, might even fine London or England, uh, Britain in particular, for the fact that we're not meeting our air targets. And that's a danger. It's much better to spend the money on making things better than spending it on a fine. So you're fully behind the Mayor's plan to make London an electric car city by 2015? Well, I must declare an interest. Um, our members join us because we provide a breakdown service for their, mm. their car or their bicycle. So we provide virtually all the breakdown services for electric cars in the country. So it would be, in one sense, in our interest for everyone to go out and buy an electric car tomorrow. However, one must look at this in the round. And although you could argue that the £60 million proposed to be spent by Londoners on this project is a, a pilot project to get things going, and there could be an argument for having that, there might be much better ways of spending that money. Who are going to buy these cars, and are they the people that really need to... Is that money well spent in terms of the round? For instance, <clears throat> if you went from the most extreme part of London, the furthest out you can go and still be in London, say Harefield in the northwest mm. or something, and you drove all the way into the centre of London, and you drove all the way back in your electric car, you'd still have uh, a battery that could go another journey like that. And most electric cars can do that journey all day, if you see what I mean. You don't need to have points in where you work because you can do the journey anyway. And those are the cars that are available now. Next year and the year after, by 2015, when he says it's all be up and running, you'll find that the, the hybrid cars will be available. There could be electric in town and petrol elsewhere or what have you, and there are... Because this is the problem. It's all right running around the city, but if you want to go from London to Sheffield on the motorway, you're going to run out, aren't you? And this is the problem, because who are going to buy these cars? They tend to be bought, and our research shows, they tend to be bought as a second car, unless you live very close to the centre of London. So the first car is going to be uh, the, the petrol-driven car that can take you up to Sheffield or wherever, the second car can be electric. So you're, in effect, you're subsidising the people who can already afford a second car. And in but London, as you well know, yeah. <laughs> it's not a high use... Uh, London is not the, the place where most people have cars, and many households are still car-less or car-free, depending on your political point. How, how soon before we get I mean, the improvements in electric vehicles so you could just buy one and run as far as you like in it? Well, as far as... I like, um, as far as one likes. It depends on whether you expect to go to London, to Edinburgh in one go. I think that's going to be a, a long time to be able to do a journey like that. However, most people don't do that journey. Um, and even if they do do that journey, they don't do it in their, their second car. And lots of people, unfortunately, do have two cars or even three. So it's a question of horses for courses. If we're always purchasing a car on the basis that tomorrow we're going to go from London to Edinburgh, then we're always going to buy uh, larger and uh, cars that can go on a, on a fuel tank of petrol, as it would be, um, for a long time. Are, are you really saying buy... you would rather the Mayor spent this £60 million on something else? I, th I think one has to be very careful about why, how we spend any money. As, as, as you know, when you're having to... It's, you've, got a, you've got a pile of money to spend... Which is the best place to spend that money? Within transport, it probably is more cost-effective if your real aim is to reduce the impact of uh, transport on the environment, is probably to reduce all speeds to 20 miles an hour. That would be probably the most cost-effective. 
even on, say, the really busy roads uh, in London? The no, 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 not on the no, busy roads, um, main roads, metropolitan roads, mm. as the GLC used to call them. Those roads would maintain... Not the, the red routes, then? Red routes, yeah. Um, they would, generally speaking... I mean, I'm not far bit from me to suggest that um, which routes will specifically be 20 or 30, but a rule of thumb, the main roads would be 30, 40, 50, depending on what their condition is, but this residential roads would be 20. And in London, depending on how you make that network, you'll find that most people are quite close to a main road. So they, they go up from 20 to 30 relatively quickly in their journey, and they hardly lose any time at all, if they do lose any time at all in their journey. But the safety increases enormously, and the propensity for people to get on their bikes also increases, meaning that we get greener faster. It probably is a much faster way of getting London greener than introducing electric cars. And the big decision that's coming in just two weeks' time, of course, will have a huge impact, is the fare increase. Would you rather that £60 million was being used to prevent the fare increase um, and because clearly when you increase the fares some people go back to their car. I, I think fare increases are quite difficult um, to deal with in that um, <clears throat> there are some... I think we've got trapped. I was very much in favour of the zonal system from way back to the 80s when you introduced uh, the zone system which had a tremendous effect on usage of transport, uh, meaning that people could use one mode of transport and then another and still use the same ticket and use it several times a day. Something that's taken for granted now that wasn't unless you were a season ticket holder in those days. I think that it's a much more complex question to answer. I would like to see us be much more flexible in the prices that we charged. For instance, we charged the same price going out of London as into London in the rush hour, when the train's going backwards, if, as it were, the train's going in on return journey, are almost empty. It seems to me there's a lot more um, availability of transport services which are being priced out, and we're squashing people at the other side. So it, there is a market mechanism we need to use, which is more complex than saying... Well, say go someone who lived in Hackney then and worked out at Romford... I would be running against the traffic and effectively could almost travel free. There I would, and back. I, I, well, not, not, well, they could probably come back because on the mm. back, if they're coming back at the normal rush hour time, it might well be that they're, they're coming on a train that's almost empty in, in the reverse. Yes, I, I, I can't see why we don't do that. I mean, it's, uh, Just to get the people out their cars. Yeah, and also the trains have to do that journey anyway so they can take the, 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 the people in the rush hour back again. The trains have to do this circuitry. Mm. Um, so why not use the uh, encourage people to pay very minimal, if any, charge at all for the return journey? And I think we, we're missing a trick. When you look at the, the amount of uh, people that are squeezed into the central area of London, I, I think that we've got to do either provide much better uh, facilities to allow people not to be uh, in cattle conditions, or we have to put the prices up. I mean, something has to be done to make it civilised. Uh, someone who doesn't use uh, the transport in London in the rush hour very often, because I'm fortunate enough to be travelling outside at the time, I don't know how it has suffered. It, it, it's a deplorable. And what's your take on the failure of the Copenhagen talks? Are you depressed today at that? Uh, well, I wasn't expecting success, so... Um, of course, greatly saddened. I think we are way behind. I'm going to say we, the world, is way behind what it needs to do. I believe 20 years ago that had we gently gone into the, in an idealistic sense, in an, had we gently gone into this process, recognising what we might have to do, do it early, do it gently, do it together, we would be way past where we are now, fighting over who, who gets what out of what pie. We're getting in a situation where people are always watching their backs, and it could be a very dangerous period. We're going through probably the most dangerous period, uh, well, maybe of human history. I don't want to be, um, make it too bold uh, a statement, but the next five years are crucial for what we need to do, and it could be that we have turned a corner. I don't know. I'd have to wait until we see real figures, because people have been promising, Britain promised... Uh, uh, from 1990, that we would reduce our our global footprint. But have we really, if you include air flights and 
shipping and so forth, if you include the imports we get from China and elsewhere, have we really reduced our footprint or are we just playing numbers? It's very and difficult. Insofar as there is a reduction, it's largely because the Tories closed down all the remaining mines in... in Indeed, it was the, a dash for gas. Yeah, so and it was... I mean, without that, I mean, we'd be up there with the worst polluters. We would look very silly. So we, we look. Some politicians have been very pious about this, but by that one act, I think it was that one act alone, mm. actually, uh, we were able to look pretty good. But in fact, go round to any other northern European country, and I'm not saying that other countries aren't doing this, but the, my own experience, they've been planning along these lines for a much longer time. Um, they are building into their planning and their engineering and their thinking. For long. So that's why Copenhagen, as a city, can say we're going to go carbon neutral by 2025. 20, uh, and we're thinking still of reducing in this country by longer periods in, in terms of London. So the, the competition between cities is that London is far behind. And that's why we're being uh, perhaps um, taken to court for not fulfilling our, our clean air obligations, whereas other cities are way beyond that. And it takes decades to plan this. As, as you know, it's, uh, these infrastructure projects, these decisions and strategies can't be laid in in, in, in five years. They have to take uh, 10 to 15 years, 20 years before they bear fruition. That's perhaps the problem. Politicians, understandably, have to deal with the realities of getting elected the second term. As you know yourself... When well, my we... problem was the third term. Andrew, <laughs> on that very depressing note and that sad memory of the, the great catastrophe um, last year, um, I thanks for your contribution and comments on that. Just to let anybody know who's planning Eurostar journey, Eurostar has confirmed that it has cancelled all services today because of the continuing severe weather conditions in northern France. We strongly recommend that travellers whose journeys are not essential change their tickets for travel on a later date or have their tickets refunded and we'll provide an update on your star services for tomorrow so that's anyone who's packing their bag to get down to the eurostar terminal now don't bother all services on eurostar have been cancelled today and on that rather gloomy note and thanking andrew once again for his contribution it's